Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to How Equipment Can Make or Break Perceived Immediacy in Video Conferencing uh, with Cass Hall from the University of Idaho. My name is Amy Schumacher, and I'm going to be moderating the session along with Anna Thompson, fellow Northwest Learning Board member. If you have any questions during the session, you can post them in the Zoom chat and Cass will get around to them. Um, the session is being recorded and it will be made available on our website probably within a few weeks. And finally, I wanted to say thank you to our sponsor, HonorLock, for helping us make this conference possible. Um, they provide online proctoring with a human touch, which you can learn more about um, in their Slack channel. All right, now I will hand it over to Cass. Thank you. Okay, so I will just jump right in. Um, and what I like to do first with this is uh, dive into what I mean by perceived immediacy. Um, so if you've never heard of that term before, I'm, I'm going to relate it to technology and um, specifically relate it to uh, technology that we might experience when we're video conferencing. Okay, so um, the perception of an individual regarding the verbal and nonverbal signs of closeness and willingness to to communicate in interpersonal settings. Okay, so if you think about this, every time I have a conversation about this on campus, it's it's really about unpacking what that means in certain situations. So if you kind of set the stage for yourself, think of when you know that you have to do something via Zoom <laughs> um, and you have to interact with other people while you're doing it, not just kind of sit back and, and, and listen. Um, what is the best circumstance? What's the best room for you to use? Is it your office? Is there a specific classroom? Is there a great meeting room that you've experienced? And the reason why I say this is because I think um, during COVID, we really found out some new ways to listen and learn about what we were doing with technology. And um, we started thinking about the spaces that we were in and how we utilize those spaces and whether or not people at a distance um, are getting um, the immediacy in, in conversation that we want them to get from those experiences. And so the example I give you here is if you look at the picture on the left, um, this is a beautiful conference room that we have in the top of the College of Education. And um, typically the person that's hosting the meeting sits at this chair on the end, right, right up here, okay? And you've got people um, often packed down both sides here. And then you've got this screen on the opposite wall. And how many of you have seen, have lots of conference rooms that are set up this way? Um, this, this is kind of the, the typical, right? You've got the screen at one end of the table and then you've got everybody around and, and somebody that you know is controlling what's going on there. Um, when you're in this conference room for a meeting <laughs> and there are people at a distance, the people appear on the screen at the, at, the, at the end, but unfortunately you can't see them real well because usually somebody else is sharing the screen and you know showing what's going on. Um, and basically uh, what happens during the meeting is the people who are watching from a distance, um, you can see the camera down here at the end is focusing this way to the table. Well, every time the person at the head of the table talks, everybody turns the opposite way right? <laughs> so they're actually turning away from the people that are at a distance on camera. And then they'll turn back when something's on the screen that they have to look at. Um, the other problem we see here is because the screen's way down at the end of the table, and this is obviously a pretty long table because you're fitting all oh, about, I think, seven people down one side of it. Um, what happens is when you pull up something on some kind of content that you want to discuss in this meeting, nobody can see it. <laughs> okay, it's too small. If there are details, you know, often when we're having it like team meetings, for instance, we're pulling up some kind of chart and trying to read the details off of the chart and the charts the whole way at the other end on the wall and everybody's looking there and then looking back at the person that's talking and then looking here and looking back again. So it causes lots of problems. And especially for the people at a distance, it's just not very immediate. So what we started to do is look at different ways to think about these spaces, because what we found during COVID was, hey, everybody was meeting from their office and we had some of the best meetings ever because the people in OIT 
who are always at a distance, um, felt the immediacy more so than they had ever felt in being part of OIT because everybody was kind of on an equal playing field. Everybody's in their office, they're meeting from their office, they have a decent camera, they have a decent microphone, headphones, whatever. And so that was a good situation for them. So we thought, well, how could we still make that happen, but also have people meeting in person at the same time? And so we started to rearrange these conference rooms, right? And so if you think about this space right here, um, we have these small monitors, and we did this in larger rooms as well, but on this one, we just have four small monitors. Um, we have a meeting out in the middle, and basically um, that gives you, if you aren't familiar with the meeting out, gives you a 360 shot of the room so everybody can be seen on the camera and the microphone actually follows whoever's talking. Um, but then if I'm having a meeting in here, all the content's right in front of me. So I'm constantly looking at the camera because I'm looking at the content too and the camera's right there. Um, so the people at a distance are never seeing me swing to look away at the person that's, you know, talking. Um, they, uh, I have the content right in front of me so we can have a deep discussion about it. And it's a completely different situation. So if I have a choice to meet between this space and this space, I'm going to pick a space like the second one every single time. And I didn't know that before, if that makes sense, okay? And so I think that's why this is such a, an important conversation to have now. So I'm gonna go into where we started with this and, and um, why we started looking at our technology in different ways. And obviously the GEAR grant, which is the Governor's Emergency Education Relief Fund, everybody got some amount of funding for through COVID, right? Um, and there is a link up top if you wanna look at, um, you know, how much was awarded to uh, the University of Idaho and all of those things. Um, but basically, we got quite a bit of money to go towards making that distance um, piece better. Okay, and it wasn't just about teaching, it was also about how do we do regular business the way we're used to doing business in a better way. Um, and so uh, we invested in a lot of things, but among them were high flex systems and everybody has a high flex, probably a, a vision of what a high flex system looks like in their mind. Um, we invested in think boards and they're a really simple little technology. Um, we invested in meeting owls, portable dock cams, uh, laptops, and e-glass. And I'll go into the details of some of the different things here. Um, but what we found out <clears throat> is that, um, each of these systems had pieces of it that worked really well and other things that didn't quite frankly, right? And um, when we were in that situation, we of course had to figure out um, how are we gonna do this and do this quickly, right? And everybody was in the same situation with that. So we came up with these Zoom enabled classrooms um, called HiFlex. Uh, we, we later returned them Zoom enabled. And if you wanna see our version of HiFlex system, I have linked here, Ooh, whoops. I will um, fix that link, but basically um, it, it goes out to an article that explains um, what that classroom looks like uh, and, and what, what kinds of technologies are in it and how to use it. Um, but there is a 75 inch display in those rooms. And of course we put it in portable form at first. Okay, so you can see it on wheels here. Um, we got the side speakers to go with it so that the audio was a little bit better because some of these spaces were actually pretty large. Um, each of them had a computer, a webcam, a dock cam, and a think board. A think board is just this little um, mat here that they can write on from the dock cam. So it's like a, a whiteboard that sticks. It, it, heaves, it, it has adhesive on the back and it sticks to whatever you want it to. So we put these all on left turns. Okay. So this was our very simple high flex system. Um, pros and cons. <laughs> There's always pros and cons, right? Um, this allowed us to equip 43 classrooms on the Moscow campus that had zero technology in them. Okay, and these were classrooms that people were teaching in 
but these were often classrooms that they hadn't ever needed to teach at a distance before. Okay, so they didn't have people attending at a distance. And so uh, we, we completely had to sort of rush through and add these things. And it also um, allowed us to add 28 of these systems at other locations, so our other campuses throughout the state. Um, and uh, to, to be truthful, we are still adding those. Um, even now, we have a second grant that came up through um, our um, ag college, and they are adding more of these systems, especially to their outlying locations, okay, um, where their extension offices are. So we continue to do, to do this. Um, the, the plus things was that this was a way to get the, the technology they would need in their hands quickly. Um, and these went into spaces that we never really intended to be able to use this way. You can see here in the picture that this was um, what we had to do when we first put them in because we didn't have time to do a full install and nor did we have the money to do a full install. Um, so we had cords taped to the floor. Um, we had things set up temporarily so everything was on wheels. Later, we went back and if you look at the picture on the right, we actually installed these. Okay, so so now you've got the display installed on the wall um, and uh, the wires are nice and cleaned up and everything looks good. So it went from being this to being this and all on campus now all almost all of ours are permanently installed. There was one college, College of Art and Architecture, that chose to have their stuff on a movable cart because it works better for them. They move stuff around a lot. Um, Sorry, it looks like I have two of those slides in there, so I'm going to skip over it. Uh, so things that we learned in, in some of this funding, think boards were a real plus. The simplest thing in the world, all I did was ordered, and if you click up here, you can um, click to see what a think board is, and they come in all different shapes and sizes. You can totally um, resurface an old whiteboard with a think board, um, and they were just something that I found uh, when I used to uh, be in the Doceo Center, and I said, what if we just put one of these underneath every document camera at every teaching station throughout the university? And so we did that. Easy thing to do, bought over 100 of them, put them in all the spaces. Um, my team, CCTS, um, handles the replacements and the supplies for those, and it was a complete win. It was cheap, easy to do, right? And now everybody, instead of carrying around paper and all of that stuff, had everything that they needed at the lectern already. Um, another thing we did was we invested in meeting owls. You know, we had a lot of people that were teaching in different spaces or experiencing meetings in different spaces where they had that camera at the end of the table type of thing and not able, not everybody was able to be seen or heard. Um, so we made these so that people could borrow them and they could either borrow them from our curriculum center, which is part of our library system, or they could borrow them straight from one of our OIT offices. Um, so that kind of made things uh, easy for them as well. Um, another thing that we invested in that was uh, we found a need for is that we had all of these faculty that all of a sudden were teaching from their offices or teaching from home, and they were used to using a document camera and they wanted that, but how do you do that from home? So we bought a bunch of portable document cameras and started lending those out, and they were just plug and play, USB, um, really simple to use. And um, we we went with the IP though, so I have a little um, a little video there on it that I didn't mean to play, but there we go. <laughs> um, we also ended up investing in a lot of laptops. Okay, so one of the biggest problems was that faculty were finding that the technology that they were using from their office from their home was insufficient. And they just didn't have the camera that they needed. They didn't have the power that they needed. They didn't have the microphone that they needed. And so we invested in a lot of laptops that they could borrow. Um, and then we also invested in a lot of laptops where we just started looking at the devices that people had on campus and started replacing them and upgrading them. Okay, so that went pretty well, too. Um, the other thing that we... Uh, invested in and let me know if anybody has has these on their campus just do a hands up or put it in the chat but e-glass 
Um, and so eGlass is a system, and if I click on it here, you'll be able to see it um, or get an idea of it. It's basically a, um, uh, a glass board uh, that you can write on. And this is somebody using it in a classroom. Um, we didn't actually put ours in classrooms. We put them um, in offices where somebody could reserve the office space and go in and create a recording. And um, you write on the light board. It's basically a light board. And uh, you can, you know, capture a recording and then shoot it out as a video to your students. And we have people using them that way, but we also have people just teaching from those spaces live and then they have the recording to go back to too um, so it's kind of cool because if you look down through you can see then that you can be behind your recording and it, it looks really cool and it's um, much more of an immediate experience for the students so we have several um, faculty who started to utilize those um, and we try to sprinkle those throughout different locations on campus so that people all had access to them, right? So we put one in the library on the second floor in the studio, and that's one of the ones that gets used the, the most highly. Um, I, another one that gets used very uh, highly is um, we have one in the College of Natural Resources, and there's just a faculty member there that absolutely loves it and uses it all the time. He actually had built his own light board at home <laughs> and was teaching from that before we got the e-glass. So that's the extent that, you know, some of our faculty go to make their experiences for their students better. And then we have one on our Boise campus in one of the offices that we already had somebody there teaching from a light board that he had built and it was on the campus so that he could share it with others. But um, he liked the e-glass better because it was all in one system. So it was just better for him. So we kind of sprinkled those throughout. And then we also put one on our Coeur d'Alene campus and, and our, at our Idaho Falls campus as well. So that was a kind of a different technology that was a win that um, some people still haven't gotten into yet, quite honestly, and I don't know if they ever will. It was just those people that became very enthusiastic were the ones that kind of leaped onto eGlass and started utilizing it. And then the other thing we did was we created a couple recording studios on this campus, and they're in the same rooms as the eGlass systems are. Um, and we dedicated a touch monitor um a pc uh and the touch monitor was just to so they they could um you know be able to write on the ski screen annotate whatever they needed to do we added software so we added camtasia and snag it if they wanted to mess with their video recordings or be able to record and do screenshots and things like that um we made sure there was a webcam with a microphone and a ring light so that we could actually capture them good and they looked good in the video um, we added a copy holder because a lot of these faculty are used to working off of paper while they're teaching. Uh, so just a little thing there. And then we uh, put one of those in the library and one of them in our College of Natural Resources because we thought those would be the places that they got used the most. Um, so then some of our money did go towards the thing that I started with my example, which was, you know, improving our meeting spaces, because frankly, we just didn't want to continue to leave people at a distance out of the conversation. Um, and we wanted them to have that more immediate uh, feel whenever they were meeting. So uh, we, we invested in some of that stuff. And then a, a couple of the other things that we did is we partially upgraded classrooms. You know, we thought, okay, let's take a portion of classrooms and make them better for this specific type of learning. And which classrooms do we focus on and how do we go about that? So first of all, understanding, we focused on our general education classrooms. And so our general education classrooms are those rooms that can be um, scheduled by anybody on campus, basically. They're scheduled through the registrar's office and they're shared by all departments. OK, we also have a lot of departmental spaces, but we have no authority over those. My group, Classroom Technology Services, only oversees the technologies that are in these general education classrooms. And we have over 100 of those on campus. OK, so we you can see that the room numbers here in the buildings, we kind of sprinkled them around uh, to different places so that, you know, people would have access to them. And in the partial upgraded ones, 
we added ceiling mics so that the students could be heard and so that the faculty member could easily walk around the classroom and be heard from anywhere. We added a second monitor at the lectern. And this was because this was all based on feedback that we got from people that were teaching at a distance at that time. And this monitor, the, it, it actually became the primary monitor and it's a touch monitor. So now if they're teaching through Zoom and they want to pull up the Zoom whiteboard, they can just grab, um, we have a little stylus attached to each one. They can grab the stylus and just start writing on screen um, or they can annotate over top of their slides and things. So I think it just, you know, made it obviously a little bit easier. Um, some of the things we started to question after the fact was, okay, well, if we've got this system, which you can see in this picture down here, um, if I'm adding a touch monitor and allowing them to be able to annotate on the screen, do I still really need a document camera? <laughs> so we started to think through those pieces too, you know, like are we, are we um, doubling the technologies that have the same function? Could we do without this now that this has been added? Um, and so those are things that we're still working um, into here. And then the last thing that we did was we took two classrooms just to test it out and did the same as we did in the previous version, but we also in this case um, uh, upgraded our entire core system for, for those classrooms, which has to be done anyways, because most of ours are at end of life. And we also added in something that faculty ended up loving, which was a um, video tracking camera. So it auto tracks you around the classroom. And it's really great. We have it set up so that when they walk up to the left turn, it picks them up and then it will just follow them as they teach. Um, and so that has been a win as well. So I think um, what this was about for us, and this is where I kind of want to open it up for ideas and conversations from everybody else, is we needed to take the lessons that we learned during COVID, which were things like, oh, I have a great experience when I have to Zoom from my office, but it doesn't work well other places, and especially doesn't work well for the people at a distance when I'm doing it in other places. Um, and how can we change things and move forward and keep in mind those things that we learned and, and make sure that we're not losing those lessons along the way. And so um, what I'm asking you to do now is to give me some examples, like go back to um, the first slide. Let me go the whole way back here. When I gave my example of a good setup for being able to have a meeting at a distance, and you can think of this as a meeting or teaching or whatever you want to think of it as, but if we're talking about video conferencing, what makes that better? What technologies make that better? Um, and so my example was, you know, this horrible setup of a conference room, which doesn't really work for anybody, but especially not those folks at a distance. And this setup, which makes it much more controllable and much more easy to see everybody. Um, so uh, give me some ideas of things you've experienced and spaces that you really enjoy um, on your campuses and maybe things that you learned during the pandemic about this, con this subject as well. And you can type in the chat, you can open up your mic and talk, whatever you'd like to do. Hello. I can add something. I I can uh, I can add something. Um, I I think my my takeaway. Um, we we sort of have like a small classroom at where at where I work, but um, my my biggest takeaway, like to me, that anything that makes or breaks a good environment is the microphone and just the quality of a person's microphone. Um, to me, like personally, it's okay if I can't see them or or anything else, but like, if you can't hear them, uh, if there's like some kind of static or anything like that, then that to me, like that's always like the most distracting thing. And, 
and at least having like a good microphone is, is what leads to a, a, a really good environment or should be like the first thing. Absolutely. I so much agree with that. And uh, by the way, our students all agreed with that. <laughs> so whenever we first did this, I wanted to reach out and after the first semester of like learning online, I wanted to get feedback from the students and ask them what wasn't working. And they said the thing that bothered them the most was that they couldn't hear everything that was going on in the classroom. And I said, well, wonder if that goes just into hearing or seeing as well. And they basically didn't care at all, according to their surveys, whether or not they could see anybody else in the room, as long as they could see the person that was lecturing, which meant we just had to have a webcam um, at, the, at the teaching station. Uh, as long as they could hear everybody else, they were good because then they knew what, what was the question that was asked and what input was this person giving that the instructor's now talking about and I have no idea where they're at. And so they would absolutely agree with you 100% that that sound was the biggest issue for them. Do we have some other ideas out there? Everybody's so quiet today. I'm asking you to participate at 2.30 in the afternoon on a Tuesday, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of a tough thing to do. Um, how many of you, just by show of hands, and you can do like a, a hands up or whatever from um, your, at the bottom of the screen, you should see, um, oh, you should see a way, a way to raise your hand or, or, or give a reaction. They're called reactions. Um, how many of you prefer that if you have to meet via Zoom or via whatever video conferencing system you use, how many of you prefer doing it from your office? Like versus at home? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, in some cases, and some people like their home office better than their work office, right? It just depends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah like in my case i mean i work hybrid and uh, so i'm a couple of days i'm on campus and for those days if i'm having a meeting and there are other people in, in our office because it's an open uh design i go into a separate office for that yeah right? but at, but at home i have my home office and i don't need to go anywhere i'm already set up so yeah and this was the exact same thing that we got from faculty right some of them just said can I just keep my class online? Because it's too difficult to do the split thing where I've got students at a distance and I've got students in person. And if we don't have the technology to do that right, then what's the point? Um, that, was another, I, that was another reason why we had added the um, second uh, monitor to some of the systems. So if I go down through here and find the right picture, getting there, getting there, getting there. Oh, I think it was at the top, actually. Maybe it wasn't. Okay, here we go. So um, here was the touch monitor. So the reason why people asked for two monitors had a lot to do with what they were seeing um, at, the, at a distance. And so if they were in a classroom teaching, they wanted to be able to pull the chat off and see it on a separate screen so that they could follow it more closely, which is what I'm doing right now. And Lori said, it totally depends. I'm set up pretty great at home. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, people started to dig into their home offices and say, hey, I need this. And by show of hands, how many of your universities started kicking in and buying you equipment to utilize to work from home? Yeah, uh, some did, some did not. 
and and you know so we didn't we definitely didn't have a fair thing going on there among institutions but our institution um especially in oit said you know what do you need to successfully work from home and they started um you know sending home a standing desks and things like that and oh yeah we'll get you a webcam that you need and make sure that you have a, a laptop that's going to have the power that you need and you can use utilize that from home and you know here's a headset and so they allow people to basically create equipment lists and be able to order stuff through that gear grant as well because we had to think about um, we're not just worried about teaching, we're also worried about keeping the university running and making all of the offices on campus be able to function differently, right? So that became a, a really important issue. Um, and then uh, this, so uh, in this system, people were able to pull their content up on this first screen and then they could slide every anything over that they wanted to on the second screen. And so now that we've done this and people have experienced it, they want two monitors in every classroom, every single one. So as we redesign <laughs> the classrooms, we're keeping that in mind and we're adding the second monitor every time. And then um, I will show you to um, an article that I created. Um, I'm going to have to pull it up on a different browser. But basically, um, we created articles to go along with all of these classrooms that actually walked them through the specifics of using each type of system. So let me um, let me see if I can pull it up on another screen here real quick for you. Um, there we go. So I'm going to do a different share. <clears throat> so we got real specific with um, how do we teach instructors how to better utilize the technology that now we've gone to the trouble of putting in the rooms, right? Because that became a really important factor too. So this is one of our enhanced video conferencing classrooms. And it goes into, okay, when you select a microphone, you need to make sure if for some reason the ceiling mic isn't working, then you need to make sure it's set on this. And um, here's what it looks like when you want to annotate in Zoom, <laughs> okay? And so when you pull up your annotation, um, you know, you're going to start your screen share, you're going to choose the um, the screen that you want to annotate on and then you're going to click share and then you're going to go to annotate and if you whether whether or not you want to enable it for others and so we did these very very specific walkthroughs of this is how you do this thing um what we knew wasn't going to happen is i could host a workshop where i invited faculty to sit through this but most of them weren't going to show up but if I recorded it or made it part of an article that, by the way, went out to them in a newsletter that I send out from my group um, every semester. So we send out like a, a newsletter that, that is printable, but it's a digital newsletter that had all of this in it and just walked them through the specifics of how to do things um, that became a win from us too for us too because then we would get a question where somebody would say well how do i do this in the classroom or how do i use the whiteboard and i would just send them the article and tell them what section to look at right and have it page marked and so it took away so, so much of the load from us putting in this work ahead of time um, that here's how to use the zoom whiteboard <laughs> and walking them through that and then how do you get classroom help right so now we have an article like this similar to this for every single type of classroom that we have on campus um, and so now they can go to the article see everything that that is in that room see how it functions and have a walkthrough of how to best utilize the technology okay so i'm going to go back to the stop share Any other thoughts on um, different setups, things that you learned and, and um, kinds of setups that you enjoy for either teaching or learning when it comes to video conferencing environment? Uh, at my campus, uh, University of Washington, Bethel, we're still exploring. Uh, some of those options because uh, we were, well, 
not in lockdown, but we were uh, forced to go remote twice. And so faculty members are going, whoa, and then they got used to the remote. They came back and they were extending where they were pulling away again. And so um, the majority of them have requested to teach in a hybrid format. But mm -hmm. we do have some groups that are trying to investigate the option of offering this sort of high flex format and what that will entail. So we're starting on that path right now. Yeah, and that's good to hear because you are moving forward and taking the lessons learned and applying them and all, all that good stuff, right? We're currently, my team is upgrading six classrooms this semester and um, one of them will get the auto tracking camera in it. The others will all get upgraded with the ceiling mics, the second monitor, and the core system will be upgraded. So we're kind of still following down that path of we need more classrooms like this because this isn't going to change, right? And I don't know how many of you have experienced, but our, um, our departments have already started to offer the classes differently now that people are used to teaching students at a distance. So to increase enrollment or to keep enrollment higher, um, we are doing a lot of things with our programs where, hey, you can sign up for this class as a, an in-person class, or you can sign up as coming and, and joining the in-person class from a distance. And so we have it set up as two separate sections, but it's actually the same course being taught at the same time. Um, and that's just kind of how our registrar's office dealt with it, but I'm sure you all have your own stories of where that's going, but we don't think it's ever going to go back to normal, right? Um, one of the things that we're seeing on our other campuses is, um, you know, we, we often have these big video conferencing classrooms where you could um, walk into one of our other campuses and you were a student participating in the class, but the faculty member that was teaching it was here on our Moscow campus. And so we've got one of these in Idaho Falls. Um, we've got classrooms in Boise like that and classrooms in Coeur d'Alene. So one faculty member is, you know, reaching out to all of these students at a distance. Well, after COVID, when the students were all attending from home, they said, why should I go to campus to do this when I can just attend from home? I have everything I need. And so now we've had to restructure things. So now spending money to upgrade one of those classrooms whenever there's three students sitting in it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> <laughs> right. So now we're looking at, OK, how can how can we also make this work on our other campuses where we had these big spaces, but we don't need them anymore and, and have that honest conversation. I think Any other ideas? Hi, Jennifer. Hi. Um, I don't know if I want to contribute. I'm a Boise State alumni, but. Um... <laughs> oh, that's totally OK with me. <laughs> uh, um, but I was just thinking, so I don't work for university, I work for the state of Oregon, and um, something that we're really kind of struggling with, so it was nice to actually come to this presentation and see some options, is we have folks that are wanting us to go out to, um, you know, Ben, Redmond, all the different, you know, places out in the state, but then they also, there's always like a couple people who may not be able to attend because they're immunocompromised or, you know, you know, there's all sorts of reasons why people can't be in person. And so we're trying to work through that as well. So this was actually really interesting to me to think about how um, we could kind of, how can I do this? Like, I don't know, I used to have be a teacher and I had a rolly cart and I was like the teacher who had to go from classroom to classroom. And that's very similar to this, thinking about what could, what, you know, investment could we make that could make a big difference in, for the people who have to attend from home um, while we are also out trying to make connections with people around the state. And so, uh, yeah, not so much like an issue, but just like a comment, this is helping me think about what could we do? What, what's portable that could make it a better experience for those folks who are attending online? We had somebody who just had like, you know, shared the screen with the presentation on Teams and I'm just sitting there thinking to myself, this is such a terrible learner experience, but I, there was nothing else we could do. So this was good. Um, 
this is helping me think. I don't think I'm going to get one of those fancy boards, but <laughs> we might we might be able to think of something else. So I appreciate this. <laughs> well, that's good to hear. I think one of the one of the things we ran into that this drove a big change in was um, how we were dealing with our extension offices because we've got extension offices in all but two counties throughout our state. And um, so that, that's pretty huge. Um, Idaho is a big state. <laughs> and so each of those extension offices, then we reached out to with a second grant that actually a faculty member on campus had, had written. And um, we've been working one on one with each of those offices to see how can we make it better for you and for you to be able to continue to do things at a distance for your customers, which we call them their customers because the extension deals with a very different audience, right? They're not dealing with students. They're dealing with farmers sometimes. They're dealing with people in the food safety industry. Um, they've got lots of important meetings and important grant stuff going on that they don't have the facilities to support being able to do it at a distance. They were so used to like inviting everybody in to this one room in the extension office and doing it all there. And now they have to do it differently. So that grant is allowing us to, to move forward. And we're using a lot of the same technologies that we started with um, just based on you know what, what has worked and what hasn't. But then we also have people that reach out and say, well, you know, I work with 4-H and I like to be able to capture what we do when somebody is presenting with their livestock doing this and what technology do I need for that? So we have come up with those types of solutions. And in some cases, um, I'm thinking for our dairy here uh, on the Moscow campus, we have a, a dairy and um, they wanted a, a portable unit to be able to take out to the barns to be able to teach from there. And so we had to create a portable unit and it's actually in a Rubbermaid cart um, so that because you can just imagine the things that are gonna splash on this, right? Uh, <laughs> but they will actually roll it out whenever they want to utilize it in a certain area and then be able to, you know, roll it back in and lock it up in an office somewhere. And so those are the types of requests that we are now getting, um, especially from that specific college. Um, and I see in the, the, um, uh, the, the chart, or I'm, I'm reading through the, the uh, comments in the chat, um, a really interesting approach. I'm going to incorporate it into my thinking. Um, and any other ideas? Anybody else want to share anything that they've come up with um, as solutions at their campuses? Because I know it's different everywhere. Lori. Well, I'm also with University of Idaho, brand new, but I was just looking back at some notes and I was thinking how universities are really leading the way. I did a project this summer for Procter & Gamble, who their CEO was sitting at the table with the, the C-suite people uh, looking at how do we, what do we do? We learned a lot of things from covid um, and now they call it parity. How do we have parity around the table, which is exactly what you're talking about? And so I just was mentioned, wanted to add that these great big Fortune Five companies are trying to figure this out, and they're even so far back as like, how do we do bring your own device and different things. So I just think um, this is a phenomenal topic, and I hope higher education can help lead the way. Um, and maybe share some industry secrets with um, the big for profits that are out there in the world. So it's fantastic to hear these conversations. Good work on all this technology that is helping make it happen because everybody everywhere is struggling with this for sure. So that's yeah, <laughs> they certainly are. We actually had um, Schweitzer Engineering laboratories reached out to us. Um, well, they reached out because they knew I used to be part of the Doceo Center and I was the director there. And, and so I focused on technology integration. And even though I had taken another job, I was like, oh, we're doing this right now on our campus. So they just wanted some ideas. You know, they wanted ideas. What were we using to be able to make it better? And so um, they actually, you know, had somebody come over and visit and look at different spaces and talk about different spaces so that they could 
capture those ideas. And then the same thing happened with the local school districts. They were all reaching out for help. And they, of course, you know, reached out to the university. Where are we going with this? What should we purchase? We have money to purchase things so that this will be better. What should we get? And so um, some of the technologies that I was sharing and talking about actually are in um, a lot of the surrounding school districts now as well. That's awesome. Anybody else have thoughts to share? I more just have like a general question. Um, if uh, if you or anyone else here has any like thoughts or stories about, um, you know, when you when you put all this like when you have in a when you have like a classroom that that is hybrid or maybe like fully remote, and you have a teacher that has like these really good conferencing tools. Um, is there any, yeah, is there any like advice or stories about like, well, what if a student who is remote is having technical difficulties like in the moment? Um, I'm not really sure like exactly how it works. I don't know if online students can like unmute themselves and talk, um, but how do you, I guess like how do you onboard students to be successful in a remote environment um, and to make sure that like they're prepared and they have the equipment they need? Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, one of the things that we tried to do here that I think um, I've seen a lot of K-12 schools do as well is um, we did have a disparity in who had technology and who didn't. And um, whether or not the technology they had was going to be successful in helping them to be able to better connect. So um, there was a lending program that went on, you know, for students to be able to better support them. So uh, when I when this all happened, I was still at the Doceo Center and I had um, loads of Chromebooks sitting around. Um, and so we started mass lending out devices uh, to our university students who really needed something at home. And so that I think became really important. And then um, the local school district started to, well, the, the state of Idaho made it possible so that people could um, become part of a grant program that if they didn't have the technology that they needed at home for their student to be able to learn, that they could just apply for this funding and get the funding and get the technology that they needed. And so we had a lot of that happening as well. And then that, of course, got down to infrastructure. Well, great, you have the technology, but you don't have a connection because you live in this little tiny town out in the middle of nowhere. And so then that, you know, rolled into a, a completely different conversation. But since then, um, you know, uh, the fiber runs to different areas ha has been more successful. Um, it's definitely not there yet all over the state, but it's getting better. And um, things like, oh, uh, releasing a list of everywhere in, in the town that people can connect um, and get a signal where they don't have one at home. Um, or teaching people how do you use a hotspot on your phone um, you know, if you can afford to have one of those. And so in a lot of ways, um, our state was actually giving funding to people to be able to afford internet in their home if it was available. Um, yeah, so it just depended on the specific situation. I think one of the things that was the hardest was being um, communicating with students that these were the needs. And then also looping back with faculty. And when I say this, you'll probably all be like, yeah, we had to have that conversation. But we had faculty who would insist that everybody be on camera during a meeting. That's wonderful, but it's not feasible. And it's not feasible for so many reasons. One of them is that they might not have the bandwidth. Or if they do have the bandwidth, you might be sucking the life out of it during one meeting and then they have none left. They have no internet left after attending your class, right? So we have different situations out there. We also have a situation sometimes where students are embarrassed by sharing video based on where they live. In K-12, that was a huge ordeal, right? So can we teach students how to blur their backgrounds? You know, can we um, allow them to use talking avatars versus themselves if they have some sort of um, 
issue that they're very uh, shy about being on camera. So, you know, you, you, I could turn on my avatar right now and start talking like and, and look like a, a raccoon or something like that. Um, <laughs> you know, so we have those types of things turned on in Zoom now. So those conversations were hard to have with faculty and to help them to understand why we couldn't just right out insist that everybody have a camera turned on and why that wasn't um, an equitable solution in a lot of ways. So uh, I'm sure that you have experienced that. <laughs> Um, and I am going to do one last screen share because my information, if I go to the end here, is on the last slide. So if you come up with any questions after the fact and you want to reach out to me because I think we're about out of time here, um, please feel free to do so. Um, I'm CassidyH at uidaho.edu and um, I'm going to take a, a look at the chat as well. Um, and just some thank yous. Uh, the session evaluation is in there if anybody um, wants to utilize it. Also, Lori, who talked earlier. Lori, do you want to tell everybody what you did during the session? I don't know if she's still on there. She's probably finishing it up as I as I call her out here. But um, Lori is doing sort of a um, written representation of my session. Which Sorry, I couldn't find my mute button. <laughs> oh, there you go. Go go for it, Lori. Yes, I'm. Um, I am taking visual notes. So I think in pictures, and I help record sessions like this in pictures in text. And I am doing it on my other monitor. And I had 33 screens pulled up, so I couldn't get to my mute button. Apologies for the uh, delay. But I will be creating a visual map of Cass's session here, which has been fantastic. And it will be a PDF file. And I'll also save it as PNG. And I'll send it over to you directly, Cass. And um, however the access can go, if you're a visual learner, um, as I am, it helps me find the notes and the highlights afterwards. So that's what I'm doing. Thank you so much for doing that. And I'll throw it in the session folder for anybody else that wants to go back to it and see what Lori created. Um, she's new to the university. So I, I got to meet her last week and was really excited to share some ideas and, and get an idea of what she does and, and brings to the picture. So, so she offered to do that during the session. I thought it was fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. Happy to be here. Okay, and I see th um, some chat from Kelsey. Um, much of what you shared on how to prepare your students is what I incorporated to teach my asynchronous and synchronous delivered courses during COVID, explaining before class how the class can be accessed and participate depending on internet access helps. I also did a lesson that showed how we would use Zoom through chat questions, polls, breakouts, and with no need to have a camera on during class. Yeah, that's excellent. Um, and I think after the first semester, a lot of people learned that lesson. <laughs> like a lot of people that were having these roles that, that maybe were a little bit overboard, like the second time around, we're able to be like, okay, I can't do that, but I could do this instead, and, and kind of became a little bit more flexible. So thank you for those comments. And I thank everybody for attending, and I'll let um, Amy wrap it up. Yeah, thank you everyone for attending. Um, if you have a chance, fill out that session evaluation. And we will see you tomorrow at, I think the first one is 10 o'clock Pacific time per session. Yep. I'll go ahead and end it. We'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>